when we were working with a, this nonlinear complex environment, you came up with a natural way of decision making called the RPD, the Recognition Prime Decision Model. Can you talk us through that model and how it's used in these, in these environments? Sure. Um, this was our, our earliest work was, was with firefighters, and the idea uh, was how do people, how, how can people make good decisions under extreme time pressure and uncertainty? Uh, and the, the older models of decision making is you have to look at all the options, you have to look at all the evaluation criteria, and, and at, setting that up takes at least a half hour. Um, we often don't have the luxury of, of, of that half hour or even of, of t 10 or 15 minutes. And so that would suggest people can't make good decisions under time pressure, but we know that they can. So we went and we studied firefighters to see just how they handled those conditions. And uh, we thought that they didn't look at a wide range of options. They just look at maybe two, uh, possibly three, maybe just two. We thought that was pretty daring. And until we, we started interviewing them, and they said, we don't look at any comparison between <laughs> options. And so that kind of staggered us. They, and, and, and they said, we don't make decisions, which staggered us even more, for, because for them, a decision was comparing different options. And they, and they just didn't do it. Um, so we, so w what were they doing? And we, we, we studied the, the tough cases, the emergencies that they had to handle, where their expertise came through. And we found what they were doing is using their experience. They were using their experience to size up the situation, um, basically relying on patterns that they had built up over 10, 15, 20 years. And so they could, in a very short period of time, um, make a pattern match. And the pattern match, and, and you can see this in, in the diagram over here, uh, so the, the, the pattern match, you, know, you have these different possible patterns, and, and, and the pattern match tells them what are the appropriate cues so that they know what cues uh, to pay attention to and what they don't have to watch as carefully, what to expect so that they can be ready for the next part, or if, if their expectancy is violated, maybe that suggests that they've got the wrong pattern and they need to rethink it. Uh, it, it tells them uh, what kinds of uh, goals to pursue, and so that's part of the goal definition process, and it tells them the kinds of actions that are relevant in this situation. And so within, a short, uh, within like a few seconds, they've sized up the situation and they know the kind of action that's appropriate here. And that's part of the RPD model and, and, and it's the intuitive part because it's not something that they consciously deliberate. It just sort of pops in the mind, oh, this is one of those situations. Yeah, I know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. But they could be wrong. So that's the second part of the RPD model, the recognition prime decision model. Um, is uh, how do you evaluate an option? Because the only way we knew of to evaluate an option is to compare it to another mm -hmm. to see which is better. And they told us they weren't comparing options. And the way they evaluated it was by imagining it. They were doing it like popping a, you know, a, 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 um, using a, 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 a mental simulation is the process we talk about, and you know, popping a, a, in a DVD in, in, into the player and uh, doing it forward and saying, if, how is this going to play out? If I, carry, if I initiate this action, how are things going to develop? And so they imagine it, and if they like what they see, they're ready to put it into, into play. If they almost like it, then they can improve it. And if they don't like it at all, they say, what else are my options? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that, that became a, a model to describe how experienced people make decisions. And this hadn't been discovered before because most of the research was done in laboratory settings where you have usually college sophomores uh, uh, performing tasks <laughs> they've never seen before. And so they have no expertise. So you're studying. So the expertise part of the equation had been ignored. And when we studied the firefighters, that became foregrounded. That, be, that became a critical part of the, of the process. I think your, your research shows uh, that 90 or 95 percent of the time we actually make a, use the natural decision making process and only uh, 10 percent or 5 percent we actually do the rational, traditional, what we would think is traditional decision making. That, that was our research and other people try to replicate our findings and, and, and they found the same thing. So it's been pretty widely replicated, yes. Uh, yeah, most of the time we're in this mode, even for tough decisions, we're, we're using our, our pattern matching abilities mm -hmm. to, uh, to size up the situation. We really enjoy this model because now you can break down how a decision making process works. I mean, mm -hmm. when you talk to executives, you know, how do you make decisions? 
no one ever asks that question because you don't, no one really ponders or thinks about it. And so it, it breaks it down into those goals, the cues, expectancies, courses of actions. If you have your wrong goal, then you got the wrong script going through, so you got to right. read and reevaluate it. What about your team sensing or team making, uh, sense making that you go? So that RPD is the individual in right. my mind, but now there's actually a team decision process. Yeah, that makes it much nastier uh, <laughs> because for the RPD model, uh, the, the critical component is the initial component of the pattern matching, matching it to patterns I've built up uh, through all my experience. But what if, you, no, it's you and me, and um, you get certain cues, I get other cues, how are we gonna com combine those cues now to, to build patterns and to size the situation up? And that's where we see a lot of, uh, a lot of failures is at the team level, not the individual level, mm -hmm. where uh, if we've worked together, that's one thing. If we haven't worked together too much, uh, you may describe something, and I, I, I don't understand the description and so I may misinterpret it. Or you may assume I know something that I don't know, and so you don't tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Or something uh, happens and you don't think it's important, so you don't pass it along, and I assume since you didn't pass it along that it didn't happen. And so now we have a breakdown in common ground, mm -hmm. and the team sense making ha has fallen apart. So that, that's the real challenge, is, the, is working with, with teams to, to get everybody to, to communicate effectively. So what are the strategies that you recommend that these groups enhance their team decision-making process? Okay, so uh, for, for the team sense-making process, uh, a lot of it would, would be trying to practice together so that you, you can build a basis for common ground. You're using terms in the same way. Uh, you're, you're calibrating what you think is important or, or not. So the, the preparation of the team becomes a critical part of, 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 of uh, handling uh, new situations. Once you're in the situation, um, the leader and the team members need to be alert to indications that the common ground is breaking down. Uh, and these could be you know, small little confusions. It's not worth taking time to correct it, but if you see a couple, that might be an indication that maybe, maybe we, we, we're, we're, we're interpreting the situation in different ways, and that can lead to trouble. It, it's led to a number of disasters where there's been a common ground breakdown, and people don't realize it until it's too late to do anything about it. So uh, the, the um, strategy there is to try to pick up the early signs that common ground is eroding. It's, it's always eroding. Let me, let me change that. It's not a question of whether it's going to erode. <laughs> it is eroding. And so pick up the early signs that it's eroding badly enough to affect our operation, and it's worth calibrating. You don't want to spend too much time calibrating common ground, because then you're not doing the work. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to do the bare minimum to ensure that there's not going to be a, a coordination surprise that, that, that can be uh, really unpleasant. 